largest AIDS conference on earth takes place every two years. People travel from all over the world just to be there. Why? Because it isn't just about research. It's about human rights, sexuality, politics, and even culture. I'm Mark S. King, and I'm blogging from AIDS 2010 in Vienna. Welcome to a very warm morning here in Vienna, Austria. Uh, this is the MSM conference. The actual AIDS 2010 conference begins tomorrow. Today is a day devoted strictly to programs and speakers and events around men who have sex with men. Um, MSM is a term that they use to cover all men who have sex with men, whether or not you identify yourself as being gay. So what we have at the conference today are a lot of speakers who are talking about the criminalization of HIV or the criminalization of being gay. In almost 80 countries, it's, it's illegal to, to be a homosexual. And in, in seven or eight countries, you can be put to death for it. So it's a real act of courage that a lot of people even show up from the various countries today to talk about programs. And why is this important? You think to yourself, well, you know, it's AIDS, it's going to be kind of gay all week long, right? Not so much. Only 2% of the programmatic content of AIDS 2010 is devoted to men who have sex with men. So it's really important that this day is devoted to that audience. So we have a lot of work to do and a lot of speakers to cover, so let's get right to it. The opening session speakers included the eloquent Michael Sidibe. He's the AIDS director at the United Nations, and I managed to grab him in the hallway afterwards for a chat. It seems like the theme today is going to be the criminalization of HIV, the criminalization of men who have sex with men. Why is that so important? I think it's so important because uh, instead to have universal access for minorities today, what we have is universal obstacles. People are facing bad laws, people are pushed underground, they have to hide themselves, and they don't have access to services because prejudice, because criminalization, because stigma because discrimination and that society I don't want to be part of that I want to be part of society which can be inclusive I don't want society which are excluding people because uh, their uh, social uh, condition or because their uh, personal uh, sexual orientation that society will not survive that society will just lead us uh, to where we have been uh, uh, 40 years 50 years ago Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. It's Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you. Next up was a workshop on the role of HIV-positive men in the leadership of the AIDS struggle. This is what these participants had to say. It would be great if positive people could be um, the leaders, as Edwin put it, mm -hmm. um, of uh, at least part of the prevention initiative, because we kind of do know what didn't work for us. And so we're kind of in a position, in a way, I think, to say, well, you know, there's, it's harder than you might think. I believe that a lot of the fight should be led by HIV-negative men. That HIV-negative <laughs> men... I think it should be led by women, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> because I, have to, um, I, I believe that if you're HIV, if you're a sexually active man, gay man, who's negative. You deserve a medal. You should have a parade. If you have been making smart choices over and over and over again, mm. that's who we should be lifting up. Mm. Yeah, but you know? you usually, and I don't mean to come off so cynical because I'm really not, but it's like if you are like this negative game, it's usually because you haven't tested, you don't know your status. And so you can pass yourself off as... But there's got to be some that are actually walking well, no, the walk, is, right? Okay. But I'm just I mean, putting, we're, I'm we're just out there preaching out. safe sex. What about the men who are actually doing it? <laughs> You're preaching to the choir, though. I'm just telling you. I mean, it's like... For me, our leaders should be those who can lead. HIV status shouldn't matter, right? Meanwhile, I was so impressed with this young leader preparing for a workshop on HIV and youth. How long have you been doing this sort of work? How old are you? I am 23 next week. 23 next week. Yeah. You sound like a little kid saying, I'll be seven in a few weeks. <laughs> okay. So you're 23 next week. Yes. How long have you been doing this sort of work? I've been doing this work since I was 19. So it's really? Like about what is it now. like being a 19-year-old gay activist in Nigeria? 
well, it's challenging, but as a young person then, I didn't look at myself as someone who should restrain, I mean, restrain himself because of the society, but yes, right. you know, but I felt that there was need to do something. Well, I'm going to let you get to your workshop. Congratulations, thank Joseph. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I know so far for a gay day at a conference, you would think that there would be a lot more flavor to the workshops, and I apologize for that, but we're going to get to it, because now we have Jim Pickett from Chicago. Jim is going to talk about lube up your butt. Um, Jim is a My favorite a, topic. There you go. Jim has been an advocate for a long time for the, I know it's Irma, mm -hmm. which is the... International rectal microbicides. microbicides. Microbicide. Rectal microbicides. Get used to saying rectal microbicides because not as only is it a big topic here, it could be a big part of your future when it comes to safe sex. I Isn't that so. right? Yeah. Tell me why. Well, you know, not everyone can use condoms all the time. Not everyone wants to use condoms all the time. Not everyone's able to. It's sort of ri ridiculous to expect people to use condoms for 50 years of their life. Amen. Um, and wouldn't it be great to have something like a lubricant? with mm -hmm. a special property in it, which would be a rectal microbicide that would provide protection against HIV with or without condoms. Scientists haven't been looking at it. Um, it's not, when you think about that... It's just not an area of prevention they're interested in exploring? No, who, no one wants to put rectal in their grant application because they I won't know. get funded. Well, even in your workshop when you talked about rectal microbicides, my first, uh, my, I kind of went, ew. Yeah, there's, the, there's that quote we call the ick factor. I mean, it's gotten mm -hmm. better. Um, but there's a lot of stigma, denial, all you kinds of things. You know what I was thinking is with that. that with condoms you're talking about a penis, but with rectal microbicides you're talking about a. We haven't come up with a lube that kills HIV, obviously, right? right? Is, are we close to that? No. I mean, well, the I mean, we're moving along. The science, uh, the rectal microbicide part of the field, is much further behind, so to speak, than the vaginal side. Um, there's been less oh. investments. A lot of women around the world have anal sex. Ah, um, there's yes. a huge proportion, I mean not a huge proportion, but 5 to 10% of the general population at any given time. And women who are in higher risk populations, mm -hmm. um, 30 to 50% have anal sex, almost all of it's unprotected. Mm -hmm. And anal sex is very efficient, unprotected anal sex is very efficient at transmitting HIV. Mm -hmm. We're very clear that rectal microbicides are for women and men. This is a human issue, it's a human behavior. And it's a great way for women and gay men to work together on a common cause. Up next, a report on aging and HIV, and a chat with the presenters. This is Sean Cahill from Gay Men's Health Crisis, yeah. and this is, uh, this is Jeff Rungler, also from Gay Men's Health Crisis. Is it okay to complain about getting older? Because I should be grateful that I've lived this long, right? And based on the research that I saw you specifically present today, the outlook is pretty good. What we tried to do in this report was present the peer-reviewed academic literature that's out there mm -hmm. on older adults living with HIV and the, and the other health conditions that they may develop. You, you, might, you might say to me, people with HIV have a higher rate of heart disease. Yes. And I would respond, well, people with HIV are also more likely to be smokers. That's right. So it's not about the HIV, it's about the smoking. Well, it, right. And those are, the, those are the important research questions that have to be looked at. Something that I think that you were focused on is how do we treat people who are aging with HIV? Uh -huh. The services we're providing them. Does your doctor talk to you about it? What social support you have? Because that all actually, in the long run, affects someone's overall health. You showed a slide of people who were just diagnosed with HIV and right. where they said they got it. Uh -huh. If you were over 50, first of all, a huge chunk said, I don't know where I got it. And a very small percentage of men who have sex with men. They would rather say, I'm a drug addict, That's right. than say, I've had sex with a man. That's right. So a lot of these men, I think, are not reporting the reality of their lives. Mm -hmm. They're in denial. This is, for the most part, and a new population, older people living with HIV. We now have to change the senior services infrastructure and the healthcare infrastructure in this country to be able to serve the needs of those individuals in ways that will help them to continue to live good lives. Mm -hmm. um, and the little that we know about the experiences of older gay people in senior settings is very troubling to us. On that rather ominous note, I returned for one more main session, and finally, I said goodbye to some brand new friends. <laughs> hey, look, Mom, I'm surrounded by gay men from all over the world. This is the end of the MSM day here at the conference. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, the big conference begins, and the Global Village opens, and it's going to be great. But for now, so long. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.